So when I was a teenager, I had a friend named John, and John was one of my absolute best friends in the world. And we had some amazing times together, just like teenagers do together. Uh, we went through a lot of things together. One of the things that we experienced together was receiving the news that his mom had cancer. Uh, I'll never forget finding all that out and navigating that with him. Um, and it was a type of cancer that you rarely recover from. So his mom battled cancer for a couple of years, and then the news started to get even worse. Uh, my family was really good friends with them as well. In fact, my dad was their pastor, so naturally we spent a lot of time together. Uh, we navigated their cancer journey side by side with them. Uh, we even went down to Houston with them as they went to the hospital down there a few times to try to battle this. But as the news progressed and as things got worse and as she received a really bad diagnosis that she only had a few months left to live, I'll never forget this moment. We were sitting in our living room with them and his mom was a little lady, like, I don't even think she was five feet tall, but his dad was six foot seven at least, one of the tallest guys I ever knew growing up. To me, he was massive. He was like Goliath. But I'll never forget sitting in this living room with my family and their family. The news was bad. They had just received the worst possible news. And his dad looks at us. And with everything he has, with every bit of passion, with every bit of grit in his teeth, he looks at us and he says, I hate cancer. With everything he has, this grown man, I think it was all he could say in that moment, I hate cancer. A lot of you can relate to being in that situation possibly, because you know what cancer does to people. I don't know how my brain processed it in that moment as a 14-year-old. I'm not sure I really had any idea the pain or the hurt or the despair or the anger that he felt in that moment towards cancer, towards this thing that was killing his wife, towards this thing that was taking his picture-perfect idea of a life and ruining it. I don't think then I could understand it. But now... Now that I'm married, now that I have an amazing wife, what I know now is that he loved his wife so much, loved her with everything he had, and yet he hated the cancer that was inside of her. He hated this thing that was stealing her life, her strength, her joy, her energy, her ability to live a full and happy life. It was stealing all of that from her, from them, from the husband who would do anything he could to take that cancer away from her. So with that in mind, let me ask you a question. To properly love his wife, didn't he have to hate that cancer? Like if he is properly going to love his wife the way a husband should do, he had to hate that cancer that was inside of her. Think about it, how terrible would it be if he just didn't care? Imagine with me for a moment that he was just very apathetic about it and just acted like it didn't even exist. No, to truly love his wife, he had to hate the thing inside of her that was killing her, the thing that was robbing them of a full life. He loved his wife so much, but he hated the cancer that was inside of her. Now, I need you to hang on to that thought. We're going to come back to this in a minute. Um, but each Sunday, we've been working through the book of 1 Corinthians. And 1 Corinthians, it's a book written, in, it's in the New Testament, written by a guy named Paul, and it's towards the end of the Bible. Paul, the author, wrote several books of the Bible, but in this one in particular, he's writing to a church in a city called Corinth. He's pleading with them to do things in a way that would glorify God because so much of what they had been doing was not glorifying God. And Paul is writing this specific book, this specific letter to send to them to say, hey, do things in a way that honors God, that brings glory to God. And I think what we are going to look at today is going to be 
very surprising and shocking to a lot of us. And I need to be clear because it's possible to dive into this and to read this and to talk about this and to think, wow, I am glad we're not that bad. It would be very easy to read that and think of that. But hold on for a minute because what we're about to learn is that the Corinthian people were amazing at justifying their actions. They, they were, it was actually pretty impressive how good they were at justifying things. You see, the Corinthian people had this mindset that they could eat anything they wanted. They could eat anything they wanted. Because after all, the stomach isn't something that really is going to affect their eternity. I mean, their mindset was what I eat doesn't really affect eternity, so why would it matter what I eat? Now, I'm not so sure that they were worried about health back then. They weren't too worried about dieting that I know of. I don't know that they ate kale and that type of gross stuff. I don't know. Maybe they did. But what we do know is that they unapologetically overindulged in food. It was like a part of the culture, like eat all you can, eat more than the next person. In fact, their culture was known for being aggressively decadent. It was like a one-up culture. If you go low, I'm going to go lower to show you that I can go lower than you. Like, if you can do something bad, I'm going to show you something even worse. Oh, you do that? I'm going to do this and show you how it's really done. It was just one-up culture, very decadent, very, very evil. They even had these sayings that apparently were a type of anthem for them. And this anthem allowed them to justify their actions. Here's what they would say. In verse number 12, you'll notice it. They'll say, all things are lawful for me. All things are lawful for me. And then verse 13, they have this other saying that says, food is meant for the stomach and stomach for food. It's like they are saying this. Hey, this is legal, so I can do it. And if it's legal, it must be okay. If it's legal, it must mean that not only can I do it, but that I should do it. And that I should do it as often as I want to do it. As much as they wanted, wherever they wanted, anywhere they wanted, with whomever they wanted. It was this decadent culture. Their thinking was this. At the end of the day, the stomach needs food. And food exists for the stomach. That must mean that eternity will not be impacted because of what I eat. So when it came to food, they didn't care what they ate for two reasons. And I need you to catch this. They didn't care what they ate for two very specific reasons. Number one, it was legal. Eat what you want. It's legal. But number two, the stomach doesn't impact eternity. So I can eat whatever I want. So they had that mentality. Now, when it comes to food, that mentality probably isn't the worst thing. It's not good, but it's not very harmful to a community, right? It's not, it's not like really going to impact a gathering of people if one or two people really decide to just indulge in food. Not that harmful of a thinking. And I think we also can see maybe how they arrived at that thinking. Like, I think we can maybe see that. However, here's the problem. This thinking carried over to everything else in their life as well, especially in their sexual desires. In fact, it's believed that there was a temple in the city of Corinth that had a thousand prostitutes in it. And the men of the village were expected, not just if they wanted to, expected to go to that temple and participate in the things that happened at that temple. There was this belief that if you were married, your wife's job was to have the babies, stay home, take care of them, but the men would go to the temple to fulfill their desires, while the wife stayed at home to raise the kids. And all of this was normal. It was even normal in the church back then which is why we're in a series called Not 
are normal. Because Paul is writing to them and saying, hey, what's normal outside of your gathering should not be normal inside of your gathering. And what we're learning through this series is that what's normal outside of our gathering shouldn't be normal inside of our gathering. I don't think that we can properly understand just how sexually inundated their culture was. At this time, as best as historians can tell, 14 of the previous 15 Roman emperors were either homosexual or bisexual. 14 of the last 15. The current Roman emperor during this time, you've heard of him, Nero. The current Roman emperor, Nero, had a very public wedding with all the pomp and circumstances, and everybody was expected to attend. Everybody in the town was expected to celebrate it, to show up, to support it. It was a big deal. He paraded through the town. Nero did. He did all of this, and guess who he was marrying? A boy. That's how evil and wicked this culture was at that time. They had to go celebrate that their ruler was marrying a boy. Think of it. That's the culture that Paul is trying to address. So maybe we can begin to see just how inundated the culture was in sexual environments and lifestyles. So Paul, the author, he's got to get to work now. He's got to set them in order. He's got to set them straight. And so starting in verse 12 you'll notice something interesting that Paul does. He uses their own saying, their own argument against them, and he refutes them one by one. In verse 12, he says, and notice there's quotation marks there, he's quoting them. He says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and stomach for food. And we're going to stop right there for just a moment. So he quotes them by saying, you say all things are lawful for you. And it's almost like Paul is saying, yeah, but not all things are helpful. Like you may say, yeah, all things are lawful, but come on, not all things are helpful. And then he says, well, you say all things are lawful, but I refuse to be dominated by anything. Paul's saying, okay, you can say that, you can say all things are lawful, but I'm not going to be dominated by anything, is what Paul tells them. And then it says, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. Now, I need you to tune in just a minute, because right here, I need you to check something out in your Bibles. In verse 13, where does the quotation mark end in your Bible? In verse 13, in the ESV version, which we primarily use here at Cross Community, in the ESV version, the quotation mark is placed after he says, food is meant for the stomach and stomach for food. In the ESV, that's where the quotation mark ends. That's where that quote ends. But in the NIV, the quotation mark doesn't happen until after the phrase, and God will destroy both one and the other. And I think the NIV got this right, because Paul is quoting their own words back to them. He's saying, you're the ones who say food is meant for the stomach and stomach meant for food, and God will end up destroying both in the end, so I should just eat whatever I want. So the quote is their quote. They're the ones saying it. He's just quoting them. He's almost like a good lawyer. He's setting up his, their argument and using it against them. He's using their own words. But what does all of that even matter? Well, remember how good they were at justifying things? Let's read verse 13 again. It says, Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Their justification even included this. Sex is meant for the body, and the body is for sex. In the end, our sexual desires and our bodies, it's going to be destroyed anyways, just like the stomach will, just like food will. So why not do whatever I want with whomever I want? That was their thinking. 
that their sexual desire was no different than their need for food. That was their justification. After all, all things are lawful for them, right? They can do it. It's lawful. They were so very good at justifying their actions that it's actually pretty impressive. So with all of their justification, their sin, and their actions in mind, Paul continues his argument in verse number 15. In verse 15, he says this, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. There is so much we could dive into there. But Paul tells them, do you not know your bodies are members of Christ? Not that they will be one day. Not that they used to be. They are currently, in that moment, members of Christ. These are people who claim to belong to the body of Jesus. They are part of his church, and yet they keep running after desires that are harmful to them. Not that much different than us, is it? Part of his church, part of his body, and we still struggle with running after desires that are harmful to us. You see, I can only imagine that they kept falling back into these sexual patterns and traps. Man, in a city where this much debauchery was celebrated, it had to be hard to win against sin. Because don't you feel that way sometimes? In our culture, in our society, it's hard to win against sin sometimes. And I look at my kids, and I look at the world and how wicked and evil it can be And it can be pretty depressing sometimes because I can look at my kids and think they don't stand a chance. But Paul's addressing that. So what do they do? What do the people of Corinthians do at this time? Call a therapist? They couldn't because if there were therapists in the town, they were doing the same thing as everybody else. They were going to the temple. Turn to a friend? Well, the friends were involved in the same stuff. I know, how about go to the church? We'll go talk to the leaders of the church. But the leaders of the church were doing the same thing. So what do they do? Because when it comes to sexual sins, even more so when it comes to the justification of sexual sins, there's only one option. And Paul, the author, is very clear on what to do with our sexual sins and desires. And he tells them, here's what you do. Verse number 18 says this, flee. That's all. We could stop right there. Flee. Paul gets so theologically deep here, doesn't he? He says, run. You know how you handle it? You know how to handle all the problems you're dealing with right now? Get away. Run. Flee. His answer to one of the biggest problems that was they were dealing with and that we still deal with today, his answer is run. Now, I'm sure the Corinthian people were so good at justifying things that I can imagine something like this happening. Okay, Paul, we now know we probably shouldn't be hanging around the temple. Okay, yeah, we're Christians, we're Christ followers, we shouldn't go to the temple. Okay, Paul. We probably shouldn't be doing all these things that the world thinks is normal. Okay, got it. But Paul, everyone's doing it. And Paul, we've been doing this for years. Do you really expect us to just stop doing this? And I can imagine Paul saying, yeah, and run, get away, put distance between you and the problem. Get away from the problem so that you can properly put it into perspective. You see, the right answer to sexual immorality is not to stick around and see if you can handle it. The right answer is to run, flee, get away from it. 
see, we can't win. We can't beat this thing. You can't indulge just a little. The solution is simple to Paul. Flee. Get away. Remove yourself from the situation. Don't even get close to it. I think if he was writing this today, he might say something like, flee, run, get away from it, get rid of the phone if you have to, give someone all of your passwords if you have to, drive a different way to avoid that place if you must, move away if you have to, get rid of all technology if you have to. You see, this is not just a small little warning to us. We will lose the battle of sexual desire every time if we do not handle it in the way that God tells us to. We will lose it every single time. Now look, I love fire. I do. I love starting fires. I love fireplaces. I love cooking over a fire. I love camping and sitting. I don't really love camping, but I love when I do go camping to sit at a fireplace. I like that. Fire is amazing. In almost every house I've lived in, we've had a fireplace. And I love, I'm pretty simple like this, I love starting a fire, turning the lights off, laying on the carpet and watching a movie. And even better if my wife's there with me. That's, that's a good night for me. But if I'm laying there, maybe watching a movie with a fireplace going, as soon as that fire jumps out of my fireplace and into my living room, we'd have major problems, wouldn't we? So when my house catches on fire and my living room is on fire and the fire is no longer just in my fireplace, what should I do? keep watching the movie and just say, this is fine, everything's fine. You've seen the meme, right? This is fine, everything's fine, while everything's burning down behind you. You don't do that. You know what I would do? I'd run. I'd get out of the house. I would flee. I can't fight it. Me versus a house fire, I can't battle that. I would flee. I would run. And look, I know churches have this reputation of being boring and often preaching against sex. I know that. I understand that. But let me be very clear. Sex is something that should be celebrated. It it, it is a good thing, especially when it stays where it belongs, between a husband and a wife. See, the Bible is very clear about it. Within those boundaries, embrace it, but keep it where it belongs. As soon as you start getting tempted to do something or to cheat or to look or to go there or to send that text, here's what you need to do. Flee. Remove yourself from whatever situation, environment, or atmosphere has caused those feelings to rise up. Flee. You see, it did not belong inside of that temple, and it does not belong outside of our marriages. It doesn't. And here's why. Look at verse 19. He says this. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. Your body, my body, if I'm a Christ follower, is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So honor it. Don't defile it. As Christ followers, you've been filled with the Spirit of God. So Paul's telling them, why would you ever defile it at a temple full of prostitutes? They had this mindset that since now they are Christ followers, Christ offers freedom So I must be free to do anything that is lawful, Christian liberty, right? Paul talks a lot about Christian liberty. In fact, Paul had done such a good job of reminding them that, yes, there is freedom in following Christ. But with this freedom, they thought they could do absolutely anything. But isn't it funny that when we start indulging in something, often It's not too much longer until we find ourselves enslaved to that thing. Indulgement often turns into enslavement, almost every time. And here they were, embracing their freedom, embracing their Christian liberty, but enslaved to their desires. That's not freedom. That's enslavement. You see, this whole passage deals with sexual sins and the justification of those sins, But thankfully, it gives us hope. It gives us so much hope. You see, this section that we read, starting in verse 12, starts with six words. You'll see the first six words in this section, starting in verse number 12, says this, 
all things are lawful for me. But this section also ends with six words in verse 20, the end of the chapter, the last six words of the chapter, ends with six words that say this, so glorify God in your bodies. So glorify God in your body. It's almost like this. The world's anthem is, all things are lawful for me. But the Christian response to that should be the last six words. So glorify God in your body. Everyone out there might say, it's legal, I can do it. I'm 18 now, I can do this. I turn 21, I can drink as much as I want. Everybody else might say that, that's fine. But in this gathering, what we want to say is we're going to glorify God with our bodies. Whatever that means for you, whatever that is for me, we're going to glorify God in our bodies. Here's what I don't want you to miss. The fundamental reality of my life is this. It's not my life. I am not my own. The moment I gave my life to Christ is the moment I no longer have control. This passage talks about it. I was bought with a price, a high price. And that reality should clear up any confusion I have about my life. If I ever get confused about who's in charge, if I ever get confused about what really matters in this life, if I ever get confused about my desires or my labels or my future, all I need to do is remember that I am not my own. I have been bought with a price. So those decisions, those issues, they're not even up to me. So how dare I think that I can label myself when I don't even belong to me? I was bought with a price. You see, the only one who has a right to label you, the only person, the only one who has the right to label anything is the one who created it or the one who purchased it. That's it. The only person who can label you, the only person who can label me is the one who created me and the one who purchased me. Psalms 139 verse 13 says, you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. He created me, so he gets to label me. Since he formed you, since he created you, since he designed you, he planned you from the start of time, then only he has the authority to label you. And not only that, he purchased you. He died on that cross, sent his son to die on that cross, paid for your freedom, paid for my freedom. He purchased my salvation. He paid the debt I could not pay. So how dare I think I can label myself as anything, because I am all his. Let's talk to the young people in the room just for a moment. Most of you already know this, but everyone is trying to label you right now. Even like Christian authors are labeling this generation and saying, oh, they're this, or they're that, or they like this, and this is the label for them. And then not even that, everyone's trying to label your identity as well. Like, you know this, like, it's cool, like, to have a different identity, to say you're this. And I'm here to tell you that all of that confusion could just go away when we realize that we don't get to label ourselves as anything. Only our creator, only the one who purchased us, gets to label us. Man, if I, if I had labeled myself when I was 13, 14 years old, I would have been a 6'10 basketball player for the Chicago Bulls. That's what I would have been. That's what I wanted to be when I was 13. So I wish that all of us who are Christ followers would just put down the label maker. We don't get to label ourselves or other people. And if we would put down the label maker and understand that all this confusion about identity gets cleared up when we realize that we shouldn't label ourselves as anything other than his. That's it. And we shouldn't label ourselves from past hurts. This is so easy to do. I've done it. You've done it. You messed up in the past, and maybe it was 10, 15, 20 years ago, or something happened to you in the past, and you're still carrying it, and somehow you've labeled yourself as something because of something that happened 5, 15, 20 years ago. And what this passage is telling us, we are not our own. 
So how dare we label ourselves as anything other than his? My friend's dad hated the cancer that was inside his wife, as he should have. It was terrible. This is exactly why, in order to love his wife fully, he had to hate the cancer that was inside of his wife. It wasn't an option. Here's what I think. I think God looks at the sin in our life much like that. He loves us. He loves us so much. But he hates the sin inside of us that is trying to destroy our lives. He knows it's only going to hurt us. It's only going to ruin us. It's only going to damage us. And in the end, it's only going to kill us. Sin wants to rob life from us, just like cancer does. John 10.10 says this, and this is Jesus speaking. He says, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it to the full. But then sin comes along and steals that from us. So God must hate that sin. For God to truly love us, he must hate that sin that lives inside of us because he knows that it takes that full life from us. And so church, we must address sin in our life. There are moments in the life of every church, of every gathering, where it's time to get even more real, to admit that we all have so much sin in our life and perhaps we should even thank the Lord that he hates that sin inside of us because that's showing how much he truly loves us. I'm thankful that the reason he hates it is because he knows it steals the life, the full life that he has planned for me. So speaking of getting real, I'm going to ask you if you would just to bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment. As your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, would you take a few seconds and not be afraid to press into this issue in your life a little bit? Maybe we could just put down the label makers. Maybe we could just get honest and ask yourself this question. Let's everybody do this as your heads are bowed and eyes remain closed. Ask yourself this question. Am I living life to the full right now? Or has sin robbed that from me? Perhaps just like the Corinthian people did, and like so many of us do, you've become so good at justifying your sin that you don't even realize it anymore, but I promise it's done nothing but rob true joy from your life. This passage mentions how we've been bought with a price. That price was the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. So when it says that you were bought with a price, there is no higher price that could have been paid for you. Knowing that, the best thing we can do is surrender, to stop fighting, and to give our lives to the one who paid so much to purchase it all. So church, if nothing else, let today be a reminder that we were bought with a price. So stop justifying sin. Let's keep returning to the one who purchased us. And so just two things. Number one, maybe you need to turn to Jesus for the first time. Man, what a great day for that. I'm up here. I would love to talk to you. There are elders here. There are people here who, if you've never turned to Jesus and began a relationship with him, we would love to show you what you had been purchased with, the death of Jesus Christ on that cross. We would love to show you that. But then secondly, and this is for everybody, perhaps we need to hate our sin again. There's probably a day where you hated it more than you do now. And perhaps we need to look at our sin like that one more time because doing work against sin starts with admitting that we can't win on our own. We need Jesus. We need more of Jesus. We need the gospel.
So I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to ask you to stand after I pray. And I would just ask you to come forward and pray. I mean, a great place to meet Jesus, to experience Jesus, would be right down here where you're at. Sit there. But let's do work today. Let's not be afraid to dive into this and do the work that Jesus is asking us to do right now. So, Father, I thank you so much for everybody that's in this room. I don't think it's an accident who's here. I think you know exactly who's here and you know why they are here. And, God, we all battle these desires. God, we so often want to do our own thing. We often want to label our own selves. But, God, help us to put all that down. Help us to drop the label maker and help us to run to you. God, help us to see our sin inside of us the same way you do. And God, help us to keep returning to the one who purchased us, the one who created us, and the one who laid down his life on that cross. It's in your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Now, would you stand right now where you are? We're going to sing a moment of invitation and come forward and pray. Kneel where you are and pray. But let's do work with the Lord today um, because there's times where we need to do that.